Welcome everyone to our Sunday morning program. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we will begin with an opening prayer read by Stephen, followed by a reading read by Jessalyn. Opening prayer. Loud be thy name, O Lord my God. Darkness hath fallen upon every land, and the forces of mischief have encompassed all the nations. Through them, however, I perceive the splendors of thy wisdom and discern the brightness of the of the light of thy providence. They are shut out as by a veil from thee, have imagined that they have the power to put out thy light and to quench thy fire and to still the winds of, of thy grace. Nay, and to this thy might beareth me witness. Had not every tribulation hath, had not every tribulation been made the bearer of thy wisdom and every ordeal the vehicle of thy providence, no one would have dared oppose us though the powers of earth and heaven were to be leagued against us. Were I to unravel the wondrous mysteries of thy wisdom, which are laid bare before me, the reins of thine enemy would, would be cleft asunder. Glorified be thou, then, O my God, I beseech thee by thy great, by thy most my great name, to assemble them that love thee around the law that streameth from the good pleasure of thy will and to send down upon them what will assure their hearts. Potent art thou to do what pleases thee. Thou art verily the help in peril, the self-subsisting. Bahala. Say, O oh men, this is a matchless day. Matchless must likewise be the tongue that celebrateth the praise of the desire of all nations, and matchless the deed that aspireth to be acceptable in his sight. The whole human race hath longed for this day, that perchance it may fulfill that which well beseemeth its station, and is worthy of its destiny. Blessed is the man whom the affairs of the world have failed to deter from recognizing him who is the Lord of all things. So blind hath become the human heart, that neither the disruption of the city, nor the reduction of the mountain in dust, nor even the cleaving of the heart can shake off its torpor. The illusions made in the scriptures have been unfolded, and the signs recorded therein have been revealed, and the prophetic cry is continually being raised. And yet all, except such as God was pleased to guide, are bewildered in the drunkenness of their heedlessness. Witness how the world is being afflicted with a fresh calamity every day. Its tribulation is continually deepening. From the moment the Sarai race was revealed until the present day, neither hath the world been tranquilized, nor have the hearts of its peoples been at rest. At one time it hath been agitated by contentions and disputes. At another it hath been convulsed by wars and fallen a victim to inveterate diseases. Its sickness is approaching the stage of utter hopelessness, and as much as the true physician is debarred from administering the remedy, whilst unskilled practitioners are regarded with favor and are accorded full freedom to act, the dust of sedition hath clouded the hearts of men and blinded their eyes. Ere long, they will perceive the consequences of what their hands have brought in the day of God. Thus warneth you, he who is of the all-informed, as bidden by one who is the most powerful, the Almighty. Baha'u'llah. Amen. Thank you. So um, just to run over the procedure for today, we'll start off with our speaker giving her talk. And then afterwards, please save all your questions to be asked after. You can either write them in the chat box, which is on the lower right-hand corner of your screen, or you can press the raise hand button on Zoom, which is if you press the participants button at the bottom of your screen, then there's a blue hand that you can press. And then I'll go through and call on people and unmute you when it's your turn. So this week, our speaker is Dr. Roya Akhavan, and her topic is Reasons for Hope. Dr. Roya Akhavan currently serves as Professor and Director of Graduate Studies at the Department of Mass Communication, St. Cloud State University. Dr. Akhavan's work in the field of mass communication extends into a wide range of related areas, including international affairs and peace studies. Her most recent work is a book entitled Peace for Our Planet, A New Approach, published in 2017. Dr. Akhavan is a frequent presenter at national and international forums and radio and television programs. 
She has lived and worked in four different cultures, Persian, American, Japanese, and Chinese. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we are gathered on this Zoom meeting today at a time when the entire world is going through a major crisis. And partly as a result of this crisis, the shortcomings of the outworn mindsets and systems in our world are coming into fuller view. When we look at the world today, <clears throat> in addition to the acute issues related to the current global pandemic, what is most visible to us is a process of destruction and disintegration reflected in the daily news we hear about violence, racial prejudice, extremist movements, corruption, and many other horrific events. Just watching a few hours of news is enough to create deep concern, sadness, and even hopelessness. In fact, from the point of view of the immediate events around us, we may even get the impression that humanity has made very little progress in the last century toward a more advanced civilization, or that it is moving in the opposite direction. So, Today, I would like to um, take the next 40 minutes or so, <clears throat> and I'm going to now start sharing my screen here. Let's see. Um, here we go. To examine humanity's progress toward creating a better world. And I will do so from a historical perspective to see whether we can find any reasons to have hope for the future of humanity. Sorry. <laughs> okay. This should leave about 20 minutes for discussion, and I hope that you will make note of your questions for the Q&A period. So in my search to um, make sense of what has been happening in the world, I was inspired by the writings of Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith and authorized interpreter of the Baha'i teachings who in the mid 20th century put forth the idea that the world was going through two simultaneous processes, one of integration and the other of disintegration. Inspired by this concept, I set out to try to learn in concrete terms what these constructive and destructive processes have actually looked like and how they might have interacted with each other during the last 200 years. In very broad terms, the data I have gathered indicate two important things which you see on this slide. The first thing is that since the middle of the 19th century, we have been witness to um, major transformations in both the scientific and social realms. And um, also, importantly, since the mid 19th century, the course of history has not been linear, but rather a, um, so to elaborate on that, we cannot describe the forward movement of history as 
two steps forward and one step back, or a zigzag, or a, even a spiral that you know, goes up and down and just moves forward incrementally with each cycle. Um, rather, a bifurcation happened in the 19th century with two separate processes starting to move parallel to each other. One constructive and integrative, and the other destructive and disintegrative, each on its own plane. So I have structured my talk to give just a few examples of this historical transformation and the interaction of these two parallel processes in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries first, and then look for um, reasons for hope. In brief outline, each of these uh, centuries have had um, certain characteristics. So the 19th century, as I already briefly mentioned, was the starting point for unprecedented transformations in the life of humanity as a result of discoveries of both new scientific and spiritual laws, and the birth of a new separate and independent constructive process that has since been moving forward in the world unhindered and on its own plane. Every line in the charts that we have available that depict both technological and social change began to rise exponentially in the mid 19th century. For example, this slide shows, um, depicts the rise in technological innovations in the United States. The number of patents registered in the US started an exponential climb in 1850, as you can see here. And just to share one example from the social realm, the 19th century also saw an exponential rise in the number of laws enacted against slavery. The 20th century was a time when major destructive events, including two major world wars, energized, energized the constructive process and led to the birth of regional and international collaborative systems for the first time. In the 21st century in which we live, we have a time when the constructive process and the collective global consciousness it has given birth to have shed a bright light on the hideousness of the destructive and outworn mindsets of the past, some of which we are witnessing very clearly these days, and have challenged and also delegitimized their existence. In response to these outworn mindsets, which include racism, nationalism, religious strife, gender inequality, and economic inequity, those people who have benefited from these mindsets have stood up in a last stand. In other words, what we are witnessing these days is the last flame of a dying fire. It still has the potential 
to cause great suffering and destruction, but it is nevertheless going through its death pangs. So now let's take a look at some concrete historical evidence for these statements that I've just made. In the 19th century, the world witnessed several major transformations for the first time. The abolition of slavery in the UK and the United States, which was, a, you know, a very important step in the history of humanity in the right direction. The first time that the idea of equality of equality of rights for women left the realm of philosophical discussion and entered the realm of social action was also in the 19th century. Um, for example, in July of 1848 at the Seneca Falls Conference, which was a gathering in the US organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her compatriots to issue the first formal declaration of sentiments about the rights of women. The first parliament of world religions was held in Chicago in 1893 and represented six different faith traditions. This was the first time in history that the idea of an international multi-faith um, collaboration to find common ground was formally introduced at an international interfaith forum. Incidentally, this was also the first time the Baha'i faith was publicly discussed in the United States. Then in 1899, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia held the first ever gathering of world leaders at The Hague in the Netherlands to propose the establishment of a tribunal for mediation of international disputes. This event again represented the first time in history that the idea of peaceful settlement of international disputes based on international law was introduced into the arena of international affairs, which until that point only recognized war as a means of settling international disputes. Then we get to the 20, 20th century. Of course, the first half of the 20th century was among the bloodiest periods in recent human history with two major world wars wreaking unspeakable havoc across a few continents, especially in Europe. Following the horrors of the First World War, the League of Nations was formed in 1920. Although the League represented only 20 nations and fell apart after two years, it represented a major step forward toward international collaboration. Then the Second World War happened and the unspeakable destruction it caused once again awakened the countries of the world to the need for a comprehensive system of international collaboration based on collective security and the role of and the rule of international law this led to the establishment of the united nations in uh, of course 1945 and the birth of the World Court as part of the UN shortly after that. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was ratified in 1948. For the first time in human history, 
respect for the rights and dignity of all people, regardless of race, nationality, or gender, was affirmed in the context of an internationally recognized document. The 20th century was also a time when the world put an end to colonialization. The, decolonial, the decolonialization process started in 1945, and by the 1960s, most of the colonies had gained political independence. The world also witnessed the peaceful rise of China after the death of Mao and coming to power of Deng Xiaoping in 1978, and China's integration into the world economic system. Perhaps most importantly, the continent that had given the world two of its bloodiest wars came together first in an economic community and then it formed a union with no border checkpoints and a common currency. And of course, that is the continent of Europe. The borders between these countries are now marked simply by a welcome sign. Of course, other regional unions in South, Af South America, Asia, and Africa are currently at different stages of moving toward common borders and the common currency. Another important um, event was the end to apartheid, one of the most egregious forms of institutional racism, which was finally dismantled in South Africa with the ruling white minority transferring its leadership to the black majority. The 20th century also saw the fall of the Berlin Wall, the dissolution of the Soviet Union into independent states, and an end to a Cold War that had for decades made the fear of a nuclear conflagration a part of every child and adult's daily life. Finally, the 20th century was also a time of the rise of democratic systems across the globe. The number of democracies went from 26 in 19. 76 to over 100 by the first years of the 21st century. Now, the last two decades of the 21st century so far have also been marked by the formalization of many new social innovations. Some of the most important of these are, and I am not going to be able to list all of them, but um, for example, the Millennium Summit of the United Nations, which was held in September of 2000, representing 189 nations, established specific Millennium Development Goals to be achieved with active participation by all nations. The idea that all countries of the world have a shared responsibility for all of humanity was further codified during the 2016 Humanitarian Summit of the United Nations. Another important milestone has been the rise of the concept of moral capitalism. This concept involves Understanding that moral capital in any business is just as important as financial capital. 
and that stakeholders, namely workers and employees, are just as important as shareholders for the long-term viability of a business. Profit sharing, flex time, and other employee-friendly policies, as well as social responsibility and environmentally sustainable practices are among some examples of this important new concept. Another major step forward was the empowerment of the World Court and the International Criminal Court, both of which are interestingly headquartered at The Hague in the Netherlands, to enforce international law and prosecute crimes against humanity. And of course, the world, the parliament of world religions has continued to grow since its inception in the 19th century. And the most recent parliament held in 2018 in Toronto featured representatives from 50 faith traditions from over 80 countries. The Paris Climate Accord was another important milestone with 196 nations, which is all sovereign nations of the world as signatories. I'm aware that um, we, the US is no longer a signatory, but I sincerely believe this is temporary. The rise, of course, of the millennial generation which is probably one of the most important um, forces uh, that is operating in the current um, century. The generation who considers itself um, or as globally connected and socially conscious and research has shown that a vast majority of millennials consider themselves as world citizens. And this generation also has enormous impact on both business and communication practices. They demand social responsibility and a con ecological sustainability from businesses and other entities in society. And of course, um, we're also seeing um, another new phenomenon, which is um, some billionaires in, in the world arising to commit half of their wealth to um, the betterment of the world. All of these events have been taking place in the context of the constructive process. And as they have taken place, a gradual but momentous change has also taken place in the global collective consciousness. Racism, nationalism, religious strife, gender inequality, and extremes of wealth and poverty, which had defined human life for millennia as legitimate and defensible, have now been delegitimized. They continue to exist, that is for sure, but they can no longer be defended. Subsequently, those groups that were privileged on the basis of these outworn mindsets now stand to lose their privileges in the face of this growing constructive global consciousness and, as I already briefly mentioned, are taking a last stand. They're putting up a fight in the hopes of returning 
to their utopia of the past. For example, ISIS with its dreams of re-establishing caliphates all around the world. Or the Brexit movement with its vision of re-establishing British sovereignty or even supremacy. And of course, the so-called populist movements, many of which are white supremacist movements uh, that are propagating in Western countries. These are just some of the examples. If we look closely, we will also see how the last stand of these outworn and delegitimized mindsets is actually doing a couple of things. It is energizing the constructive collective consciousness in the midst of the turmoil that it is creating. And it is also contributing to a growing awareness of oneness of humanity, the need to eliminate all forms of prejudice, to achieve gender equality, find common ground in religious teachings, and mitigate the extremes of wealth and poverty. So the question we need to ask ourselves at this juncture is, <clears throat> What is the role that each of us can play <clears throat> in accelerating the constructive process and mitigating the suffering that is being meted out by the crash landing of the destructive mindsets? Obviously, we cannot assist in this constructive process by fighting against anyone or anything. The adversarial model, which continues to be prevalent in so many areas of human behavior, including the partisan political model, is completely outworn and has become a part of the destructive process. What we need to do is not to fight against the destructive mindsets that are collapsing on their own, but to focus our energies on building model communities that reflect the constructive principles of oneness of humanity, equality, justice, and peace. In doing this work, we have a few very important sources and reasons for great hope. First, <clears throat> the robust forward movement of the constructive process, which has never stopped. This knowledge should be a source of great empowerment and hope for us. Because all we really need to do is to start working within the constructive process to accelerate and facilitate it. Another reason for hope is that what we have just gone over is not just a set of data and trends it also has a powerful explanation behind it, which we must articulate and understand. Because a truly scientific discussion needs both the data on the patterns and trends, as well as a logical explanation that would only be possible if we can pinpoint the cause of these transformative trends. In other words, once we have seen this data, the question becomes, 
what is the cause of these dramatic shifts and changes? In response to this question, we can put forward the idea that the source of these changes has been the discovery or revelation of new spiritual truths. Just as there are physical laws and formulas that science is always seeking to discover, there are also spiritual laws and formulas. And these spiritual formulas are equally as precise and powerful as the physical laws. For example, when a scientist discovers a physical law, such as magnetism or the power of electricity, or when Einstein discovered that E equals MC squared, all of them discovered the truth that had always existed, but until that moment, we were oblivious to it. This is precisely why these events are called discoveries. Scientific discovery of a cause and effect relationship means taking the veil away from a physical truth that has always existed. Once a physical truth is discovered, it unavoidably spreads throughout the world and different people are inspired by it and enabled to advance it to the next level. Namely, to use the scientific discovery to innovate new things that did not exist in the world before. In other words, the discovery of new truths is always followed by new inventions based on that discovery. So it was the discoveries of physical truths and the innovations that followed that have been the source of the accelerating processes of technological change that we are all witness to every day. In the same way, the 19th century saw the discovery of major spiritual truths that humanity was previously oblivious to. Just like the scientific discoveries of physical truths, these spiritual truths had always existed but until the veil was removed from them, humanity was not aware of them. Not long after the transmission of the first telegraphic message and the birth of the global village, on May 23rd, 1844, Baha'u'llah, <clears throat> the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, announced these unprecedented new spiritual truths to the world of humanity. These are quotes from the Baha'i writings. The earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. This is the ageless faith of God. This is the changeless faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future. Women and men have always been and will always be equal in the sight of God. The transformations that began in the 19th century were put into motion by the revelation of these spiritual truths. Just as we cannot reverse the forward movement of the innovations that have followed scientific discoveries, the social innovations and new ideas that now reside in the collective global consciousness cannot be erased or turned back. The constructive process 
will continue to move forward. Of course, another reason for hope is the ongoing collective efforts of the international Baha'i community and individuals because we are not <clears throat> we are not starting from scratch. Excuse me. The pattern is already set and a culture of learning and growth has already been created in communities all over the planet. As soon as the faith was established internationally, the Baha'i international community places emphasis on disinterested service to people of all backgrounds in every village, town, and country. A Baha'i NGO joined the UN in 1948 and since then has been one of the UN's most active members. This NGO, which today represents the full diversity of people across the globe with more than 2,200 races and tribes represented, is focused on promoting the universal principles that benefit all of humanity. The same vision of service to all of humanity has propelled the social and economic development projects initiated by Baha'i individuals and organizations across the globe. In addition to these efforts, since about 20 years ago, the Baha'i world has entered a new stage where individual Baha'is around the world are taking systematic action wherever they live to help improve and transform their communities through service. These include offering classes for the children and junior youth of all backgrounds to help them understand their nobility as human beings and to empower them to play their part in service to their community and to humanity. These efforts have been very successful in bringing positive change and transformation to diverse communities around the globe. If you would like to um, be refreshed by hope, I highly recommend uh, watching some of the in-depth interviews or videos that are available on Baha'i.org website, which document the developments in diverse countries and localities across the world um, by actually narr narrating um, them through the words of the people, um, these diverse people uh, themselves. I will just share a few quotes from a segment on India. The video shows that the rural community building efforts by the Baha'is in Bihar Sharif in India have been amazingly successful in bringing greater unity and peace to the community. A young man says, when I was a child, my grandparents told me not to go into the homes of people from other castes or eat with them. So I thought it was true. Then when I took the Baha'i courses, I began going to friends' houses, eating with them and talking with them. A young mother says, while raising our son, we decided not to tell him which caste he belongs to so that he will never have the thought that he is superior or inferior. He will see everyone as equal. Mother of a young woman recently married to a young Baha'i man in a remote village says, our daughter, after making her own choice at age 25, asked us for consent and then got married. For her marriage, no dowry was demanded. So the constructive trend has been moving forward in two ways. One is indirect through what we may call the power 
of the spirit of the new age that has been released into the world as a result of the discovery of new spiritual truths. And the other is direct through individual and collective action by people of goodwill, among them Baha'is, to help move that process forward. While the spirit of the age indirectly shapes the collective consciousness of the people across the globe and propels the world forward on the innovative path of constructions, Baha'is are involved in advancing this process by building model communities across the planet. Of course, another reason for hope is the visible and increasing consciousness that I can see every day around myself, and I hope you can see it too, about the fact that the old order is deficient and inadequate. And as a result, there is a growing search for answers among increasing numbers of people in this country and around the world. For example, the question of racial inequality, open public discussion about issues of institutionalized racism in the US began to bubble to the surface only a few years ago. Today, we are seeing increasing awareness of this deep-seated issue among a growing number of people and a desire to take action to mitigate its devastating effects. All of these conversations provide an opportunity for us to engage in compassionate and meaningful discourses with our friends and coworkers about the principle of oneness of humanity as we also work on internalizing and acting according to this principle in all aspects of our own life. In 1985, which was also declared the International Year of Peace by the United Nations, the House of Justice, the highest elected body of the Baha'i International Community, issued a statement on peace entitled, The Promise of world peace, which was distributed to all world leaders and heads of state, including the then President Reagan and President Gorbachev. Among the key passages of that message, we find this quote, world peace is not only possible, but inevitable. And then, However, whether peace is to be reached only after unimaginable horrors precipitated by humanity's stubborn clinging to old patterns of behavior or is to be embraced now by an act of consultative will is the choice before all who inhabit the earth. Obviously, the best option for humanity would be for the ultimate stage of peace to be realized as an act of collective will and not after unimaginable horrors. And all of us have a role to play as catalysts in the constructive process to mitigate the suffering that is being meted out by the crash landing of the destructive mindsets all around us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Akhavan, for speaking on how the destructive processes can actually give us hope that more constructive processes can begin. Um, I see we have one hand from Emmanuel, so I'm going to unmute you. Hi. You mentioned that the 20th century uh, show, uh, 
witness the peaceful rise of China uh, and mm -hmm. its integration in the world economic and political system. Unfortunately, uh, in the 21st century, as we see it right now, China is not following, I mean, the same path. Uh, I mean, almost every week, uh, we see uh, acts of wars uh, by China in the South uh, Chinese Sea against Vietnam, the Philippines, uh, Japan. Uh, most recently in November, I understand uh, the Chinese government invited all religions active in China, including the Baha'i faith, just to tell them that they had to adapt their writings according to the Communist Party uh, Bible etc etc i mean we know that china does not respect uh, international laws anymore uh, in different uh, aspects of international uh, life uh, being uh, uh, commercial uh, laws etc and you were mentioning that uh, i mean so many good things also happening in the 21st century how uh, in your opinion you, because I mean, the, all the good things that you mentioned for the 21st century, basically, they are based on, on the spiritual evolution of, of mankind. How, I mean, we could uh, have an influence on, on the Chinese government and the Communist Party there to, to be more open to spirituality in order for China to to be part of that uh, global sharing of responsibility. I mean, right now they don't share, they, although they, they are the second economic power in the world, like in an organization like uh, the World Health Organization, a country like the US, they share approximately 20% of the budget of that organization. China, who was right now approximately the same economic power as the US, they they share only two or three percent of the budget of that organization. How I think I understand can... what your question is getting at. So if you would allow me to respond, well, um, how, how would you see uh, us? I mean, uh, the rest of humanity uh, yeah. <laughs> act uh, act in a way that uh, we can bring spirituality, uh, more spirituality among the, the Chinese government. I think that will be a, the, probably the biggest challenge in the years to come. Yes, thank you so much for your question. Um, I actually personally lived in China for two and a half years and um, quite have also um, studied and ri written about um, China and uh, the changes there. Um, and most recently, I presented at the um, Beijing Forum last year in 2000, November of 2019, which was called um, Harmony of Civilizations. Um, I think it was um, a changing world and um, prosperity of humankind. Um, so my response is that, first of all, the constructive process that I have tried to set out um, is a very macro process. And it is moving forward. But as I said in my talk, there is also a destructive process, right? Disintegrative process that is has always been and continues to move parallel to it. This is something that we really need to understand that these are two parallel and simultaneous processes. So the fact there are so many things and I, I don't want to take too, many, too much time to get very specific, but based on my knowledge, there are so many things that are moving forward um, very favorably, for example, in China, which you have brought up, in terms of um, the people uh, learning about spirituality and 
um, th there's so much changing of hearts and minds among the people. And um, so there is tremendous forward movement in the constructive process without getting very specific about it. And we can expect these um, destructive quote unquote events that appear to sort of bring up again the um, old patterns. I've already referred to some of them. Um, you know, why should we you know, expect to see Britain trying so hard to exit the European Union? Of course, I personally believe they will not succeed because it's just like going against the tide of history. Um, but not China, you know, exhibiting some, um, some old, not so peaceful behaviors. So I think these are very complex things and they're not black and white. And um, again, I will say that we have a state of crisis in the world, which has been created by the so-called last stand, or I have called it a last stand, uh, but I think the Baha'i writings would probably, if we were to search for a term, we would say the death pangs of the, of the old systems. And within those death pangs that are happening in the destructive plane, we can see all sorts of disturbances and all kinds of disappointing events that may lead us to think, as I mentioned again in the beginning of my talk, that we are going backwards, that none of these good things have happened. But that's actually exactly the purpose of my talk, is for us to get away from that kind of thinking, to realize, as Shoghi Effendi has said, that there are actually two simultaneous processes going on in the world, integrative and disintegrated. And we should expect to see both of them. The problem is because what is happening immediately around us that we see in the news, just like some of the things that you mentioned about China, is, is that's what we can see with, with the naked eye that's what becomes our reality. And that is why it's so important to look at the progression of history and to see that compared to 100 years ago or 200 years ago, how far we have come. Of course, we have a long way to go. But to also see these processes as parallel to each other and expect to see a lot of the disintegrated things and destructive things still happening in the world. Um, what I have tried to do today is to make the constructive process visible because it is not visible to us. Thank you. We have another question um, from Ryan in the chat, and he says, what individual actions do you recommend we take to promote racial equality and peace in our daily lives? You know, I, um, there, there are very, very concrete things that people are providing. For example, I, I shared something on my Facebook page that I saw. Uh, it's called 75 things that um, white people can do, you know, to address racism. It's a very detailed list. Um, so there are many, many actions and we have no shortage of recommendations and um, out there. But I think even in that list, when I looked at it, several of the items um, really focused on education, about educating ourselves, about understanding more about 
other people and their conditions and the root causes of the problems that are, they are facing. And then we also have to develop the empathy so that we can actually engage with people and be helpful. And I think from the Baha'i point of view, the most important part of this is to truly internalize the fact that humanity is one. We may um, you know, know this intellectually, but that's one thing. To truly internalize the oneness of humanity, to embrace people of all races and backgrounds as equal is another. And I think that's, that's the most important starting point. So the actions we can take, we have to make sure we expand the circle of our friends. We have to make sure as parents, we do not teach our children racism because there are a lot of things that we may not even realize that we are doing. We have to have an active conversation with our young people about these issues so that they can become clear that humanity is one and injustice is not, uh, cannot stand, that um, as Baha'u'llah has said, speaking, you know, uh, you know, relaying the words of God to us, the best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. So I could try to list, you know, a few things and I've already done that and there's more. Um, but I think we have to develop a sense of urgency and we have to examine our own um, thought processes and biases and make sure that we are free of prejudice and we are engaging wholeheartedly with our, let's say, black brothers and sisters um, as a family. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Erwin, who says, do you see a lasting change for the better in the way scientific research will be done without the usual rivalries and competitions because of the current pandemic? I think that is a really um, great point that uh, you have brought up um, in this question, because actually, you know, I have been sort of studying and following all of the different uh, what I would say constructive things that are happening um, as a result of this crisis, right? We, we have the concept of um, constructive and destructive processes. We also have the concept of crisis and victory, that, that crises do um, tend to bring out sometimes the better angels of our, our nature. And I think that I see an unprecedented level of recognition, though it is not by any means complete, but it is still unprecedented that um, many people around the world, including scientists, are recognizing that, you know, they, they are not doing science to compete and, and get published in some kind of journal, but what they're doing their science for is to serve humanity and to save lives. And I think this is another um, sign of the growing constructive global collective consciousness we are seeing. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions, but I'll pause in case anyone has any last minute questions.
Um, I see a question from someone, so I'm going to go ahead and try to unmute her. <clears throat> Hi, I just wanted to ask the question regarding kind of creating or modeling communities that we would like to see. I just kind of wanted to know what that would look like and how we would get to that, that point. Thank you, that's, that's a great question. Um, yes, so basically that, that is the recipe uh, that the, the Baha'i world is really following, is that we are trying to develop communities that first of all, include the full diversity of humanity. And I think um, we can see again, success in that. For example, worship, even in the United States, that is supposed to be a melting pot, is something that is done vastly still separately. You know, on Sundays, the whites go to white churches and black people go to black churches. Baha'i devotionals need to be representative of the full diversity of humanity or in the community. Um, Baha'i children's classes. Uh, of course, these are Baha'i inspired. They're not necessarily Baha'i, but, uh, or um, the, the junior youth programs. Um, these are really important vehicles of community building and they are in fact uh, representing the diversity of humanity. Then once we gather people of diverse backgrounds in the same spaces to worship, to study, to work together, to consult with each other, um, we then have to make sure that we are engaging with each other lovingly and with respect and listening to each other and empathizing with each other. Um, so to really re bring humanity together in these community spaces and engage in a way that reflects the principle of oneness of humanity and the um, desire and the longing that we have to see justice, to see compassion, and to see a heart-to-heart -heart sharing of views and true consultation and true communication. Because if there is any sense of adversarialism, there will be no true communication ever. And so these are all the, the attributes that I see, and I hope I have answered your question. Uh, I, <laughs> a little bit, I guess I'm just wondering, like not, I guess maybe both individual and societal, like if we're saying we want to create these spaces, which is great, I'm just wondering what the first steps would be, particularly if someone was not, say, in the Baha'i faith, like how would you go forward with trying to create these spaces? And then I think my second question was, it's great to discuss um, inequality, it's great to try to educate others, but my fear is that they just remain conversations. That's what I've noticed um, tends to happen is like, yes, we know there's a problem, we know this is wrong, this shouldn't be happening and then it just stays there and then no one knows what the next step is to actually take action. So maybe that's more of my question. How exactly do we take action so that whether it be justice is served or we try to, um, you know, encourage eliminating all many of the isms in, in society? That's probably a very deep question. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a wonderful question, and it's one that we all grapple with because, 
you know, the things that I mentioned are, um, are actually action steps, right? So let's say that we are going to have um, a gathering. Uh, we need to make sure that we have diversity. If we, um, for example, what is going on in uh, let's say in Minneapolis these days, I, I have um, shared some Facebook posts that put the focus on, on the need for not putting the burden on our um, black brothers and sisters to fight for justice, but that um, we all need to take whatever action we can to help in this process. But you know, unfortunately, the, the long-term achievement of this goal is going to remain sort of a very gradual process societally, and we need to acknowledge that, but that does not mean that as individuals, we cannot just take the steps that I already talked about in, for example, holding conversations. Um, let me just give you one example. I'm an educator and for the last several years, one of the action steps that I've taken as an educator um, is I require um, anti-racism workshop from every student in my classes, regardless of what the topic is. They have to attend the four and a half hour um, anti-racism workshop that's offered at our university. I constantly speak about the importance of justice. Um, I teach some ethics classes also and um, focused on racial justice and how we can dismantle the stereotyping that we often see, for example, in, in media images um, and in our own conversations and in our own perceptions. So I think the action steps are, regardless of what we're doing, whether we're an educator, whether we're, a, you know, a mom, a father, a, um, you know, we work in whatever environment, that our actions and our conversations um, really embrace this. So. The fact that just saying, oh yeah, things need to change. Well, that attitude obviously is not going to change things. And I, I share your frustration because believe me, um, I, I am <laughs> engaged in this work and I, I see the slow uh, progress that we are making. But at the same time, I, I um, in collaboration with the Persian uh, Baha'i Media Services a couple of years ago, I um, worked on a 15 minute video called The Struggle for Justice. And you can find that on YouTube where, um, you know, I look at, we look at the um, forward progress that has been made as well as how far we have to go. And so sitting here, looking at what is happening, we have to keep in mind that truly things are not going backwards. They're just getting more exposed. And there are people, uh, they're giving people more opportunities to engage in these discussions and, and truly understand uh, what the issues are. And, as someone who has been really sensitive um, to this issue and trying to make change, I see progress in the midst of all of the horrific things. So this is a, <laughs> an attempt to really address something that I know with all of the emotions that we have is difficult to, to address, but um, I hope that gives a little bit of an answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have a few more hands. The first is from, I believe, Mercedes, so I'm going to unmute you. 
Thank you so much. I just wanted to share a couple of points very briefly uh, with Kashima. I think, and also, of course, uh, with all of us. Um, in my experience, the first thing for us as white individuals, non color individuals, we need to listen to this community. We need to listen, 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 because I learned with all my best intentions and everything that I thought I knew from the Baha'i teachings, I still, when I open my mouth thinking I'm working in favor or defending uh, and walking the path of justice in this uh, uh, issue, I misspoke. I said things that was uh, hurtful uh, to my black brother and sisters. So even the verbs or words we are using may be hurtful, offensive, and totally wrong. So I learned that I should listen and um, learn the language that is healing and defending and uh, the way that um, exhibits uh, uh, not my white privilege, basically. Um, and the second thing I learned was to use my white privilege to defend and support the colored brothers and sisters. The things that they cannot do because of all the discriminations and prejudices, and I can do, I should use that privilege. I should use my white privilege for the benefit of bringing um, uh, everyone together. So these are two things that I learned and I thought that um, I could share with everyone. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Yes, listening, learning the language and, and using our privilege. Yes, thank you. Um, next, we have a question from Ricardo. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so kind of going off of the, um, the, the, the topic here, I kind of wanted to get a little bit more information, at least on some kind of perspective on uh, like the fallout of, let's say, in, in the George Floyd, uh, or specifically in the George Floyd uh, incident, in that at least the way I feel, I feel like it's it's definitely clear that again it, it's upsetting that once again another uh, you know person of color uh, you know is you know mistreated or, or targeted by law enforcement and and I think for the most part everyone kind of is, is rallying around that coming together on that and agrees that it was what happened is wrong but I think a lot of where the current disagreement is happening is in the actions of uh, of the people. You know, you kind of see both ways of, you know, it, on one hand, people are, are, are upset and, and they should be because off this, this happened, this seems to happen more and more and what changes are really made, you know? And on the other hand, you know, well, people don't, you know, this, these protests don't need to become violent or cause destruction. So I kind of wanted to see, is there, how do we, find that, you know, happy medium, not happy medium, but like, how, where is that balance kind of in all this? How, how do we know, how, what's kind of the barometer of, well, you know, at some point you have to, if things keep happening and, and they don't seem to be changing, you have to, you know, take action. But at the same time, you also want to be, you know, respectful towards, you know, people and, and, and things and society and organizations. So what, what, where's that balance coming from? Yeah, that, that is a really, really important question. Um, so what comes to my mind is are a couple of things. One is that all of the leaders in history who have um, successfully navigated that path, although in some way they have also had to make great sacrifices have been people like uh, Martin Luther King, 
um, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, people who have truly had to uh, lead major movements um, and they have tried to do it peacefully. Um, I think that they know something that's very important. At the same time, I think in, um, you know, in having respect and listening to what is going on, I think we also need to at least try to understand um, how a terrible boiling point can be reached. Um, you know, when the white people don't hold their part of the rules, right? So if you see that, you know, for example, not all members of the police by any means, but there's still some members of the police force who are constantly even hunting down um, black people. And, you know, in the case that we saw, you know, someone puts their, their knee on the neck of a handcuffed, unarmed black man for eight, nine minutes. How can we expect restraint from the oppressed community. The fact that there is in fact a lot of restraint and I actually shared some pictures of the peaceful, beautiful, peaceful protest yesterday in Minneapolis where uh, there was a circle of drummers and dancers and thousands of people were just sitting and sitting together and um, they were from all races and backgrounds, white, black, you know, um, and uh, Native American, Asian, all, all races. And that, that really is the majority, of course, of the people who are trying to raise their voices and, and show their longing for justice. But then you have a very small percentage of people who are not able to be restrained anymore because of the extreme oppression that they have been um, experiencing. So to summarize, the success of any movement does depend on it being able to remain peaceful. Because, you know, you cannot have an eye for an eye. <laughs> uh, I think it was Gandhi who said an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. But at the same time, we must understand why this is happening. Um, do not condone it, but understand it and make sure that we change the system so that it, it is not this oppressive. Um, I hope that gives a question, gives an answer to your question. Thank you. Um, I think we only have time for one more question. I think Emmanuel has another question. So this will be the final one. Let me unmute. Well, actually, it's not a question. It's maybe a response to Kashima and Ricardo, how we can avoid violence uh, and how we can go beyond just, I mean, uh, nice talks. Uh, and I believe there are so many organizations out there, uh, really peaceful organizations acting within the laws, working, I mean, for the implementation of all those good principles that uh, Roya was mentioning in her presentation, we should be more active in all those organizations. Uh, 
I think that's the key. And historically, it has been proven that those organizations, of course, it does not, uh, it takes time, but they have been successful. But we have to be active. We, we have to do our part. Yes, thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much again to Dr. Achavan and to everyone also for their insightful questions and comments. So next week, the speakers will be myself and my brother Bayan, and we will be speaking on racial prejudice, a blight on human progress. So more directly towards some of these latter questions. Now we're going to end with a closing prayer read by Bayan. Thou beloved of my heart and soul, I have no refuge save thee. I raise no voice at dawn save in thy commemoration and praise. Thy love encompasseth me and thy grace is perfect. My hope is in thee. O God, give me a new life at every instant and bestow upon me the breaths of the Holy Spirit at every moment in order that I may remain steadfast in thy love, attain unto great felicity, perceive the manifest light, and be in the state of uttermost tranquility and submissiveness. Verily thou art the giver, the forgiver, the compassionate. Thanks everyone again for coming and we will see you next week. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.